we will call the notice of the 15th meeting of the Common Council to order. Pat, would you call the roll, please? Bauman? Here. Berg? Here. Bonet? Here. Doyle? Here. Graf? Here. Manny? Excuse. Montemayor? Here. Moody? Here. Perez? Excuse. Rinfleisch? Here. Stephan? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderwill? Here. Wangaman? Here. Warner? Here. Winninger? Here. 14 present. Quorum's present. Alderman McGraw. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd move that we dispense with the reading of the, pre the minutes of the previous Common Council on the same stand approved as entered on the record. Move to second to the dispense with the minutes of the previous Council meeting in the same stand approved under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <coughs> carried. Alderman Winninger, would you lead us in a pledge of allegiance, please? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, uh, thank you Your Honor. Uh, due to uh, string of columns I've been writing in the paper. One of them we wrote about were uh, forgotten memorials around the city. And one of the memorials I became most concerned about was a memorial up on Calumet Drive and Geely Avenue, which was to the veterans of World War I, or I should say to the dead of World War I. Uh, there were quite a few number of young men who were lost from Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. Since that time, the veterans organization has stepped forward. Uh, one of our local landscapers has offered to uh, do some additional landscape would do some plantings around the stone. The city uh, has offered to uh, trim that tree bushes, tree brush brack. And also on November 11th, which is the actual uh, anniversary of the ending of World War I. In fact, it was at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month that the war ended. And at that moment, we're gonna have a little bit of a ceremony up there. Uh, the veterans will lay a wreath on the grave and uh, I believe Alderman Manny will come and say a few words, and uh, you have graciously consented, if your schedule permits, to also come up and perhaps say a word or two, and the veterans will also be there. Uh, some representative of the veterans will be there. So I'm hoping that uh, anybody who has a moment's time just stop up there, because it was a day that's been kind of <coughs> forgotten. Uh, it was usually quite a big day years ago when they had uh, Veteran, uh, Memorial Day, or we used to call it Armistice Day. So it's just something that I'd like to see done again and uh, honor the men that gave their lives in World War One. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two notices this evening. One is the ordinance that has been introduced for the vacation and discontinuance of unpaved alley between South 17th Street and South 18th, 18th Street and between Alabama Avenue and Georgia Avenue. The second, we have an ordinance that has been introduced for the vacation and discontinuance of a portion of South 16th Street from the south right-of-way line of Illinois Avenue to a point 150 feet south. Then we have two hearings this evening. The first one is to amending the zone, zoning of property located at 1320 Niagara Avenue. And the second one is amend the text of the zoning ordinance to permit exceptions to maximum height regulations by conditional use or variance procedure. Any interested party wishing to be heard on any one of these two hearings? Any interested parties wishing to be heard? Please step up to the microphone if, you, if you'd like to be heard and give us your name, address. Which hearing also? And what hearing you're speaking on? Oh. Okay. At the microphone, I can't hear you. Uh, my name is Desiree Galseth. I live at 15. No, you don't speak on this. This is not a hearing. You, you have a notice. Okay. These hearings are for zoning. Your notices you don't speak on. There's no time to speak unless you speak when the document comes up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone interested? To any interested parties wishing to speak on the hearings? It's on the hearings. Alderman Groff. Yeah, I move that the hearings be closed. Right. Move to the second the hearings be closed under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 
Uh, Pat, maybe we should clarify that a little bit between. Yeah. Hearings, you, you may speak at a public hearing, but when it's a notice, we're just saying that this ordinance has been introduced. It will be acted on later in the agenda. At that time, you can only speak if the floor is opened up to you by an alder person. Um, I don't foresee any reason for you to speak since everything is favorable on the document and you're, that's what you're here for. So I would just kind of wait. <laughs> okay, thank you. Resignation, Steve. I have a letter dated uh, October 28th uh, to the mayor from uh, Alderperson Wangaman advising that uh, with reluctance he's uh, resigning his appointment as trustee to the library board effective immediately due to conflict with another committee. Had to be accepted and filed. <clears throat> okay, public forum, Pat. Okay, public forum, Susan Hundley. Good evening, I'm Susan Hunley, 632 Michigan Avenue. I spoke at the last public forum. I really did not intend to speak again, and I promise I won't speak after tonight. <laughs> but I received numerous phone calls after I did speak, and I thought it would help to just clarify some of the points that I brought up. I spoke about the room tax issue, and a lot of people called me and they wanted to know actually what room tax is, and um, <laughs> Collecting it, I just assumed everybody knew. Room tax is collected by anybody that has lodging in the city of Sheboygan. We collect it from our guests, and uh, we turn it over quarterly to the city. And the, it's a state-mandated um, oh, well, legislation uh, mandated by the state of municipalities choose to do this. So there are certain uh, laws that the city does have to follow if they collect the room tax. and. Um, we now are at 8%, so we charge our guests 5% state and 8% city room tax. The tax is intended to promote and develop tourism. Um, it does not go back to us. We do not use this strictly as our only means of um, revenue for um, advertising our businesses. Most of us advertise, I know for my business, somewhere in the 10 to 12% of our um, budget goes for advertising. Some people asked why I cared about the room tax issue, why I've taken the steps that I have. Um, a lot has been brought up lately about ethics at this public forum. Uh, I just feel we are collecting this money from our guests and it's not going for its intended use. Many people asked why we didn't consider some of the negotiated terms from the city. Well, there really hasn't been anything negotiated. We did have a chance at our June 2nd Common Council meeting when it was proposed that a room tax commission be formed. At that time, Tricia Pugal, who is the um, chairperson of the WIA, Wisconsin Innkeeper Association, supported this commission. She drove from Milwaukee and spoke on our behalf. At that time, it was not approved. Uh, we did file a notice of claim, and that gave the city time to contact us, and many people asked, um, what's the next step? Well, we weren't, Renee Sush and I are the two that were on the notice claim. We were not contacted during that time. We weren't contacted at the meeting when it was discussed to turn down our notice of claim. The next step is the lawsuit. We have gone to numerous meetings since before. There was over 20 meetings before we filed the notice claim. We have continued to go to meetings after. And uh, we would like a resolution besides going into a lawsuit situation. Unfortunately, at this time, that's the only thing that we have um, available to us. The legal fees many people were concerned about that I mentioned would not be incurred by the city, as I mentioned last time. We do have a city attorney that would represent the city in the lawsuit. Our attorney fees would, we would ask to be reimbursed for after we win the lawsuit. Many people ask me what that figure would be. It, this could go as far as the state Supreme Court. We pay our attorney on a per hour basis. 
The only reason we did not hire a local attorney and we hired a Milwaukee attorney is because he is the law, the room tax expert in the state of Wisconsin. And his fee is a little bit higher than a local attorney, but we felt that we needed the advice of somebody who was an expert. Thank you. Do you want to speak? No. Okay. Dulce Johnson. Thank you. Mayor Schramm, members of the council. On September 15th, I spoke at the public forum about concerns regarding the city's contract for the Blue Harbor Resort and condominiums. On October 6th, another Sheboygan citizen spoke at the public forum and accused me of making wild legal interpretations and unfounded interpretations of this contract. The inference was that since the contract was crafted by Quarles and Brady, it was sacrosanct, and that unless I had passed the Wisconsin State Bar, I was not qualified to understand it. I did not question the credibility of Qualls and Brady or the legality of the contract, but I did question some of the provisions of the contract vis-a-vis -vis the best interests of the taxpayers. No, I have not passed the Wisconsin State Bar, but I learned to read at the age of six and I think I understand the English language very well. I even know the meaning of a few big words like defamation. It was only after reading all 125 pages of the contract signed July 30th that I decided to speak about some of my concerns. In the last several days, I have consulted with two graduates of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School who are members of the Wisconsin State Bar, one of whom specializes in development contract law in Minneapolis, and they have both corroborated my statements. I address the issue of rent that Blue Harbor will pay the city for the convention center and restaurant and quoted verbatim from the contract. As rent, under the convention center operating lease, Great Lakes will guarantee that the room taxes generated by the hotel and condos will equal or exceed the room tax payments. This is found in paragraph seven. Hardly a wild legal interpretation or unfounded interpretation. Secondly, I spoke about the $200,000 that is being taken from the $8.2 million that the city is borrowing to build, equip, and furnish the convention center and restaurant. The, con the creation of this fund was confirmed by Alderman Warner when he spoke at the public forum on October 6th and characterized it as a rainy day fund. The $200,000 will be deposited in the condominium completion escrow, and per paragraph 40, the city will be permitted to deposit the condo completion escrow into the condo completion escrow account. And the disbursement of this count is set forth in items E and G of paragraph 40 and states in part that the funds will be credited against the guaranteed property tax payments and or the guaranteed room tax payments to the extent that the real estate and personal property taxes and room taxes are not sufficient to make the guaranteed property tax payments or the guaranteed room tax payments. This again is verbatim from the contract. Therefore, as I stated, the taxpayers could ostensibly be paying the property and room taxes for Great Lakes. Finally, I spoke about a page of financial information, information presented at the May 12th Committee of the Whole meeting, which contained figures for guaranteed room tax payments, debt service for the convention center parking lot, and the difference, which amounts to close to $10 million over the term of the contract. That page of information is not part of the contract. And when the information was requested under the Freedom of Information Act, it was not available to the public. This was very alarming. In May and June, I and others had asked several aldermen what that $10 million was going to be used for. No one could answer. Rumor had it it was going to be given back to Great Lakes. After the September 15th meeting, I asked Alderman Graf about it. He didn't have an answer. But Finance Director Gebhardt was nearby and explained that it will be up to the council to determine the disposition of the $10 million accumulated over the term of the contract. Of course, we hope the Blue Harbor project will be a success. After all, there are millions of tax dollars invested in it. And it would be nice if all you had to listen to from this microphone were positive thoughts and rhetorical fluff. But that is not the reality of the mood of many of the citizens of this community now. And while optimism has a lot going for it, sometimes we also need a measure <coughs> of realism. You need to understand the anger and the frustration that many of the people of this community feel because of the debt that has been incurred in our name. And hope may not rule the day. Finally, 
I also know a little bit about President Harry S. Truman. He was a man who, as leader of this country, accepted responsibility for his decisions and is well remembered for that little sign on his desk, the buck stops here. As always, thank you for your time. Renee Susha. <clears throat> Renee Susha, 303 St. Clair Avenue. I've, a, I've been attending these council meetings regularly for over a year. I started attending because of what the city is doing with the room tax. What amazes me is how much I've learned while I've been attending these meetings. One thing is for sure, the city has a lot of room for improvement. I've been accused of pointing out issues and not offering solutions. Here is my first solution. I would like you to look hard in the budget and find $5 to please buy the city clerk a stopwatch. If you've reviewed the tapes of this meeting, you will find that um, when you get up to this microphone, you're supposed to have five minutes to speak. If she doesn't like what you're saying, you're cut off at about four and a half, meet excuse four and me. half minutes. Excuse me, excuse me. I do not cut you off in four and a half minutes. I'm watching the clock above your head. Mm -hmm. Do not accuse me of cutting you short. Okay, Renee, I've, I have watched, never done that. I've watched the videos over and over and I can document it and prove that you have left some people go upwards of six minutes and others of us are cut off at four and a half. Anyone, I'd be happy to share the tapes. I'll, I'll type you a report and send it to all this of you. This is not arguing session. Keep, please continue. Let's move forward. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to touch on is that there is a document that you can get through the um, the finance director's office, it's an official statement, and I would recommend that all the aldermen take a moment to look at this if you haven't already done so. This is an excellent resource and it gives you a nice snapshot of the status of the city. One of the things that I do want to clarify though is when you look at the city's rating, you'll see that um, standards and poor rating for the city is a double A minus. Um, if, if we were to go any lower than the double A minus, we would fall out of the double A category. Um, the best standing in a double A category, I believe, is a double A plus or a solid WA, double A, but we're at a double A minus, and I think you're gonna have to watch it a little bit. And one of the things that really caught my eye in this, in this um, booklet, and perhaps the finance folks could uh, speak to this more clearly later in tonight's session, is if you look at the um, unfunded retirement liability, you'll find that we owe $10.5 million. That's a little bit high. Um, unfunded retirement liability, $10.5 million. This is on our long-term debt sheet. So you might want to take a look at that and see what you can do to get that debt down a little bit. Um, one of the suggestions that I would have is um, taking a look at some of the outstanding fines and unpaid parking tickets. Right now there's over $200,000 in outstanding parking tickets. Um, during the time frame that these became outstanding, um, over $2.5 million of parking tickets were issued. So one suggestion I would have is um, perhaps you could repeal the stormwater fee and implement a true user fee by uh, implementing 24 hour a day parking meters that would be monitored seven days a week. If you've ever gone down 8th Street on a night when the theater is on, you'll find that there's hardly any parking spots left. And if you were implementing uh, the parking, uh, it's a true user fee because if you don't want to pay 25 cents for the meter, you could park three blocks away and walk. Whereas a stormwater fee, you have to pay it. You don't have a choice. So this would be a true user fee. Lastly, I just want to touch on the uh, Quarles and Brady fee. Um, since Quarles and Brady did not have a signed contract with the city, my question to the alderman is how do you know they were looking out for the city's best interest uh, with the Blue Harbor contract? And without having a signed retention letter or any type of signed contract, I think that gives the city bargaining power over the rates that you were charged. I believe Quarles and Brady's charged upwards of $350 an hour, and without a signed contract, I would think you could get that down to maybe $200 an hour. Thank you. Okay. I should tell her she's got some time left. Henry Capitello. Uh, Renee, Pat just made a thing. You, oh you still have time if you still want to go on because you guys wasted some time here back and forth. My name is Henry Capitello and I'm here to speak regarding the uh, the item and that's on your agenda, which is uh, Home Inc. had been looking to secure a property at uh, John Court. And what was surprising to me was that apparently there was a recommendation that this 
our request would be rejected. I was not notified. Nobody contacted me. Um, and then I find out that it was denied. Um, I did contact a couple of the alder, alder, alder persons to raise my concern. The concern that I have is that um, from the last meeting that I was here, there was a, well, what, what I would say was a threat, um, which basically said that the council should look at some of the funding that's provided to Home Inc. Um, and I think that was uncalled for. I think that uh, a lot of people spoke at that public, uh, at that time, um, on a number of occasions. The only person that was in any way threatened was myself. And I'm wondering, why is that? What's the difference between myself and all the other people that came here and voiced their concerns? The only thing that I can see is that, to be honest with you, is I'm Hispanic. There is no difference. That's it. And if that is, I'm going to tell you now, that is not right. That is not right at all. And the, the, the tactics of intimidation and basically um, trying to uh, uh, impose this on us is uncalled for. I feel that uh, I will raise concerns about it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know that once you accepted a grant from the, uh, the city that you automatically gave up your civil rights. I thought it was under the First Amendment you could come and you could speak your mind at a city council meeting and not have to worry about any um, repercussions of what might happen. Um, threats of, of possibly losing money from an organization that you work for. I mean, those are the types of things that are just uncalled for. And uh, when I come here, I basically speak of concerns regarding the city, regarding some of the, some of the taxes, some of the fees that are being imposed. The reason that, that I did come through all the, all the, uh, the public uh, meetings that were held and also here was to speak on the stormwater sewer fee. That was the, the concern that I had. And again, I'll say, um, I will continue to speak up. Um, I believe that uh, I have that right. Um, I believe in God and I know that uh, God will hold people accountable. And not, not here, you may not feel that you're accountable to the taxpayer or to the citizens of Sheboygan, but there is one person that is accountable, that's God, my Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. And I'll tell you, I will continue to come here and voice my concerns. Very good. What meeting weren't you, Henry, what meeting weren't you notified for? It was the finance committee meeting. I think it was the finance committee meeting that uh, reviewed this, this uh, request. Okay. And we'll be taking that document up later, Alderman Graf? It's in the cons consent agenda, agenda number nine. Okay. No problem. He can talk now. Oh, Alderman Graf? Just, just to answer, Mr. Coverdell, um, there was a, a little bit of a mix up. Uh, one department thought they were going to um, notify Mr. Capitello, and another department thought they were supposed to, and no one did. So um, it's be going to be referred back to committee tonight as soon as we, we get to the consent agenda. But one other thing I wanted to mention uh, regarding um, Ms. Hanley and her um, uh, suggestions and so forth. Right now, regarding the room tax, we contract with the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. And um, Ms. Hanley is a member of the Chamber of Commerce for her, her bed and breakfast um, or her um, lodging facility. And uh, we contract with them. And we have, I believe, um, three years left of a five-year contract with them. And that's how we determine how the room tax should be distributed and, um, and justified that way. D. Olson. It's just easier for me to step around this way. I hope you don't mind in the back. Um, D. Olson, Executive Director for the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, and on a positive note, we're, uh, from the Chamber's perspective, we're pretty pleased with the way our community is moving forward. Our Chamber Board is excited about the upcoming year. I was conversing earlier um, with some of our bid district uh, board members, and they're very pleased with the way the community is going as well. 2003 has had many positive influences as well. 
Uh, not, this is not a perfect world, but there are many positives going on in this community. You know, and it's really tough to be faced with looking at the PGA coming next year, the men's bowling tournament. I would hate for a lot of those people to pick up some of our media and, and uh, get the impression that this is a community in distress and with lots of arguing going on because, boy, it sure looks that way these days. A lot of negativism, and negativism breeds more negativism. So keep that in mind as we move forward into 2004. I do think that there should always be a forum for people to share their thoughts, uh, but how that's done um, should be on a very professional basis. Um, at recent chamber meetings, we spoke of the efforts of the Common Council and the members of the, the city administration and the mayor and your efforts to try and hold property taxes uh, and hold the minimum for a tax levy of a 1% increase. We think that's very commendable in very tough taxation times. Communities across Wisconsin are struggling with their taxation issues and the chamber commends the city council for its leadership in this area. Many communities are not seeing the type of growth and construction that we are seeing here in the Sheboygan area. The benefits is to everyone because it increases the equalized valuation and allows all taxpayers to benefit from the growth. Projects like Acuity and Blue Harbor, what's happening in the South Pier area and the downtown are extremely important to business retention and growth for our community. Denny Moyer is at a tourism conference tonight, so he uh, could not be here to share with you the developments of his quarterly report that he puts together. It's a third quarter report. Um, a full report will be provided to you at some time in the very near future. Uh, the third quarter over last year is up 31.8%, the most inquiries we've ever had posted in a year. That's a full year. Um, previous high total in 2001 was our, the year that we had the, the previous high total. At that time, we had 22,038 inquiries. This year, third quarter only, up through the first three quarters, is 32,456. That's more than 10,400 from any of our best years. Two primary areas for that. Our readership is up in many of the ads that we're placing because of the increased room tax and our ability to uh, do a good job of marketing. And our trade shows and, and tourism shows, our sports shows and things that we go to are up 139%. Booking inquiries are up enormously. The men's bowling tournament, Danny reported that over 1,000 rooms have been booked already for that and the bookings aren't done yet. That will run from January through May of 2004. Blue Harbor is attracting a lot of inquiry. Uh, they are booking a lot of uh, activities and conferences and weddings and things of that nature already. So uh, the inquiry uh, component of that is already taking place within our office. The PGA, of course, is drawing a lot of inquiry as well. We've also been able to receive a couple of GEM grants this year that have created uh, some additional marketing opportunities for us as a county and an area, and those are generating inquiries as well. We're working on the 2004 marketing plan at this time and doing so very aggressively so that we can continue to grow the tourism component of our overall economic picture. I'd like to publicly thank Danny Moyer and the members of this council, Common Council for their support in providing us the funding mechanism to make that happen for our community. I also wanted to make mention that we are on the threshold of our last big sesquicentennial event. It's called Home for the Holidays. Kim Lipom is the uh, committee chair for that particular event. My co-chair for the overall sesquicentennial is here as well, Alan Rudnick tonight. We have Saturday the 29th, a lot of act November 29th, a lot of activities going on including a children's shop at Above and Beyond, Songs and Stories with Stuart Stotts at the Mead Public Library. That starts at 2. The John Michael Kohler Arts Center will have a number of exhibits tied to the sesquicentennial. And at 7.30 p.m., Sue Darrow will have a School of Dance performance for the Nutcracker at the Wild Center. Sunday, again, many of those items repeating. And then there will be a sculpting contest at Fountain Park 
um, as well as the JC's Holiday Parade downtown with enhancements because of the sesquicentennial. Dean. Tied with the tree Dean, lighting. I have to call your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. That's it. Okay. A uh, couple things I just want to touch base on listening to the listening to the remarks out there. Uh, okay. The overall cost management of Blue Harbor remains a solid remains solid as the project is currently around a half a million dollars under budget. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. We're running somewhere around there. TIF six debt issuance will cover the guarantee tax payments and development agreement by Great Lakes, and I hear out there that the taxpayer could be footing this bill. No. Currently, there are 147 jobs created out there in construction, and around several, seven to 10 local firms already got the jobs out there. So the jobs are staying in our community. The city does continue to maintain its AA bond rating, even with Blue Harbor going up. Despite, despite our recent cost overruns of legal fees, the project remains under budget. It has become practice on a local radio talk show to compare our project's performance to the Packers. Yes, even though the project is $500,000 under budget, the legal service expenditure is disheartening. However, just because Brett Favre has one bad game, it doesn't mean he won't get into the Hall of Fame someday. Taxation, the current 2004 budget sent to this council included it included a 0% increase, not 1%, 0% increase in property tax rate, and includes 2.2 million in spending cuts. We have led the way others are following. According to Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance, and I do have the information here, Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance, make copies for anyone. You can get it on a computer, otherwise I'll make copies for anyone who wants to see it. The city of Sheboygan ranks 191st out of 220 municipalities. And that survey was since 1992. According to the same survey, the same 10 years, the city ranks behind Howard's Grove, Sheboygan Falls, Plymouth, and Oostburg for tax rate increases. Tax increases average 4.6%, while property values rose 9.4%. Cited on August 3rd, 2003, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Sheboygan ranked fifth lowest in southeast Wisconsin since the 1997 in the tax rate increases. And of course, Expansion Magazine, magazine cited us for a five-star five community for business relocation. The other thing was mentioned on a, on a TIFs, and we gotta watch our debt, we always watch our debt, and we've been very conservative and very responsible in this city. Total debt equalizes about 2.9% of the valuation. TIF district debt equalizes about 1.5% valuation. TIF districts have been recognized by leaders in Madison of both political parties as effective tools for local development, development that increases tax bases, and most importantly, creates jobs in your community. There are, current, there are currently 11 active TIFs in the city of Sheboygan. Correct, Rich? I believe that's what we have right now, 11. Nine out of 11 have positive balances are doing well. The overall TIF payback right now to the city is around $47,000. That's a positive for the taxpayers. Since 1997, in just six years, there has been an investment in our community totaling more than $500 million. $500 million in six years. In the previous 12 years, there were $750 million. And from 73 to 85, there were $300 million. All new TIF districts, and this is very important because we have not had any guarantees, all new TIF districts since 1997, which includes the Blue Harbor, has agreements with the developer that if the developer is not, does not generate the tax dollars to cover TIF expenditures, the developer will pay a portion of that difference. While all this growth occurs, the city still, again, maintains its AA bond rate. Thank you for listening to me. I also have another letter I should have read before, and I missed it, and I want to, it's DPW record, DPW record, DPW department from Kathleen Bender at 1423 Broadway Avenue, and I'm always proud 
to read a letter that cites one of our city employees. I am writing about a city employee, Ryan Sazma. I don't know his immediate supervisor, so I'm asking you to pass this along through the proper channels. I live in the midst of the Broadway Avenue construction project, and to say that I have been a bit inconvenienced would be a major understatement. Ryan has been a lifesaver. He has gone beyond what I am sure his, his duty. He has been most helpful answering any questions and concerns and many issues, and certainly goes the extra mile. Very nice letter, Tom. Congratulate Ryan on that, please. Thank you. Alderman Mooney. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Kathy Bender is my neighbor, and I think of all the construction that's going on, she's probably feeling the biggest impact. She's had quite a bit of her yard um, not removed, but she has, I think, a five-foot retaining wall in front of her house now that she didn't have before. She was pretty much on the level. And uh, I agree that Ryan has been very, very helpful. I've talked to him probably three, four times every week for the last couple of weeks. And every time I have a question, every time I have a concern, he gets back to me. And I would just like to compliment him and, and Tom, too. Thank you. It's good to hear. Thank you. OK, with that consent agenda, Alderman Groff. Your Honor, I'd like to pull a document forward, number 1536. Okay, Alderman McGraw. Um, at this time, I'd move that uh, 1536, the resolution, that it be put upon its passage. Let's move to saying that resolution 1536 be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor. Uh, this is the document that um, allows us um, to issue and provide for the sale of 12 million 40 thousand taxable bond anticipation notes, which now has been changed to 12 million 20 thousand. Um, and I'm going to ask to have the floor open to Carol Wirth from um, our auditing, our, our bond firm of um, Griffith Kubik okay. to, to speak on this. Okay, before we do that, Alderman Monte Mayor, you have a question or? No, no. Mine is about the consent agenda. I'll come back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Super. So I would move that the floor be open to Carol Wirth. Move to the second that the floor be open to Carol under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Please step up to the microphone. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Nice to be back with you again. Um, I have prepared a, um, a memo that uh, contains the information about what we're doing tonight. And I uh, just want to briefly cover some points in here so that um, you uh, feel comfortable when you take action on the resolution. And what we're doing here is uh, 12 million 20,000 taxable bond anticipation notes. Uh, they're different than the previous bond anticipation notes we did this year because they are taxable. We typically issue tax exempt. One of the reasons they are taxable is because we are providing funding for two purposes here, the convention center project and for what we will call the resort project. And both of those projects, uh, the debt service, uh, has guaranteed revenue streams under the development agreement. And because of that feature, uh, the federal arbitrage laws requires the debt to be issued in a taxable manner. Okay, just so you, you understand why we're doing it this way. Um, we have prepared the official statement, again, for this financing. Uh, submitted it to both rating agencies in request of our uh, long-term rating. And once again, uh, we have been confirmed with a AA3 from Moody's and a AA- minus from Standard & Poor's. Um, just for your information, those are comparable ratings. They are both in the AA category. Uh, Moody's uses numbers of 1, 2, and 3, 1 the highest, 3 the lowest. Uh, Standard & Poor's uses minuses and pluses or absent either one of them for the middle. So uh, they're, they're both comparable ratings. Um, we began, we had both ratings in hand uh, by the uh, end of the day Tuesday. So we started the marketing process Wednesday morning. And uh, it was, uh, you know, hindsight is, is, always, uh, is, is always nice, but we... Um, uh, can now tell you that the, tr the Treasury market has slipped significantly since last week Wednesday. So we were able to jump into a market and secure the investors uh, to produce a net effective rate of a 3.95%. Um, today, by the end of, of today, that market has moved more than a quarter of a percent. 
So, um, you know, that's always nice to see after the fact. Um, there's no way of, of knowing that, obviously, when you enter the market, but I can tell you that um, we have at least hit the market on a taxable uh, at a very favorable time. Um, also on the memo at the bottom, you will see uh, the purposes as to how we arrived at the 12 million and 20,000. You will see the convention center project and the costs associated with that to total $8,030,000. You will also see the resort project, which also has city funds of $2 million applied. So therefore, we are issuing $3,990,000 of this money for the resort project. Okay, so that's how you get add the two numbers together to arrive at $12,020,000. Okay, the second page of my handout uh, has a little history in the paragraph, the first paragraph that talks about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and it's, it says that we're expecting the construction of our facilities to be completed by July of 04. And funds from the guaranteed revenue streams would be available to the city beginning in 2005. And those funds, again, will be used to offset the debt service requirements. Now, there is interest that we are borrowing for the payments to be made in 2004 and the first payment in 2005, that we make interest payments <coughs> semi-annually. That is called capitalized interest. That means we have that included in this borrowing. So the city keeps the money and holds it to make those interest payments in 04 and 05. We also have what's called a call feature on this issue beginning in 06. And any day thereafter through June 1 of 08, there's a two-year window, as we call it, that's very important to the city. The reason we have that window is because as any dollars become available to the city, the city can prepay the principal. We simply issue a notice to the bondholder saying that we're calling it in. We're stopping the interest. It could be in any increment of $5,000 and above. So if the city has $100,000, they want to prepay principal, you can prepay principal. So that means you do not have to refinance that debt on June 1st of 08. So it's a very important feature that can save the city a lot of money into the future. Um, and also the addition of the, or the extension of the life of District 6 by 4 years is another important feature that allows the portion of the financing that will be repaid from the TIF increments um, to be retired through the actual end of, of TIF 6 now. Um, and that will be repaid, obviously, from increments of the current as well as any future development in TIF 6. Uh, the city will receive the money on November 17th and, and invest the money until it's needed to pay project costs. And then the rest of the report includes the debt service schedules, which really starts with page three, which is the combined number of 12,020,000, and that is, again, combined for marketing. And um, the, the top of the page has the interest payments. The bottom of the page has the pricing summary as to how they were sold to the investors. And then the page following that, page four, again, is the schedule split by purpose. And this is the way the city will keep track of uh, the convention center project and the debt associated with it, and as well as the um, resort project and the debt service associated. So as the city does apply funds um, to the repayment of the debt, uh, we certainly know um, what has been paid off and how. So are there any, any questions I can answer? Are there any questions of Carol? Alderman Groff. Not a question, but I, I'd like to ask Carol if she would um, comment on one of the speakers this evening had mentioned something about our, our bond rating and, and how um, it, could be, um, it could be dropped at, at certain points in time. And this is one of the first years, I believe, that we've ever taken as much money out of, out of our, um, our reserve funds as we have. And I just want the entire council to know what effect that has on not only the 2004 budget, but on future years, and what it could present if we dig in there any more and come up with any more of those funds to be used for for operations or, or whatever we may need them for. We basically have to have to keep our reserves as they are now, which I'm sure Carol will, will tell you because um, uh, I'll let her speak to okay, that. Okay, thank please. you, sure. Well, first of all, let me start by um, mentioning that 
All of the financings that we have been doing in this calendar year, um, we were fortunate enough to have both rating agencies here and visit with them, show them um, the site of uh, the Blue Harbor development and talk in detail about all of the financing that the city was going to be doing for, for the annual capital expenditures as well as the Blue Harbor project. Mm -hmm. And the rating agencies were very pleased and very comfortable um, with what we presented to them, the plan of finance for that. And, um, and, and so they have made mention of that, of every financing that we were going to do in the next phase always appeared in the current uh, credit rating report. So, so they have been very comfortable. So if you go back and look at any of the credit reports that we have had up to this point, there has been very positive comments regarding all of the financing for this project um, this year. Now, what has come of concern is as you are moving through the year, you are now entering um, your budget process. Uh, there are more concerns about the questions that appear uh, or are discussed in the rating conference calls are, um, well, how do you expect 2003 to turn out? Okay, what do you expect that the city may do with regarding the fund balance? Because Double A credits, more is expected of you. The things that are within your control that affect your rating is fund balance and your debt structure. There are things that are a significant part of your rating, such as your demographics and the economics of your area, that pretty much aren't under your control. So, but yet all of them have to come together. And if you have some weaknesses in those things that are not in your control, it becomes more crucial for you to maintain the things that they consider are within your control. So that's where AA credits are expected to have a certain level of fund balance. However, if you ask them specifically for a number, um, they will dance around that answer. Um, and primarily because it's, it, it would be nice for us to just say, here is a certain percentage and that's it. However, they also take into consideration the difference in times. And they say, what is your ability, if you use fund balance one year, let's say, you know, I'm just picking a number out of the, out of the year. If you use $500,000 one year, and you say, well, we've done it for the last five years, so we can do it continuously into the future. However, it may not be as easy to keep raising that money to apply into the future. So it's your ability to generate the revenues that becomes more difficult. So that's what's starting to, to you know, as, as you know, with all the, the slowdown in the economy, they're starting to look to, well, um, municipalities are uh, trying to hold down taxes, and so they start saying, well, you know, we've got this pot of money over there, this fund balance that we can start to, to eat away at, and a little more so than what we did in the past. Well, the rating agencies are getting a little nervous about this. So what they're saying is, well, well how much do you expect to use this year? And if the number is, you know, even greater than what you might have done in the past, that becomes a concern. And then they say, well, what, what are you going to do the following year? Well, we might have to do that again because we really can't see where, you know, we're going to generate any, any additional revenues. So, so the concern becomes greater and greater because they start, start seeing the fund balance used for recurring purposes. So, so they consider you may start to dig yourself a hole that you cannot come out of. So what they do is um, they print a uh, statement in your credit report, and that's where we're at right now. A statement in our credit report that says you're in the process right now of making some tough decisions with regard to your budget. And you are considering things for a 2004 budget, and you are, of course, looking down the road to your 2005 budget. And based on what you may be considering in terms of the application of your fund balance, that's going to make them very nervous for a double A credit quality. Okay, so, um, so there is a statement in there that says they have this concern. And the reason they put that concern is there is to let you know that they're watching you. And every time you will come back to market, they're going to obviously watch what your decisions are. And if you cannot maintain a level of fund balance, which they feel you need to maintain to keep your AA credit quality, then they will drop the AA down to a, a single A, which with the next level down would be an A1. Now, they don't do that without notifying you. It doesn't just happen. However, we do have a statement right now, so we're being notified that we're watching, they're watching us. 
Okay, so it's, it's just something for you to be aware of. So it's not a statement that's related to the debt we're issuing or the structure of the debt. I mean, they have been happy with that since, since July, so it has nothing to do with that. It's just simply where you're at right now, this time of the year, and the decisions that you have to make. And so they're, they're helping give you some comments about that. And I would guess, Carol, a lot of that has to go along with the state budget and what we get back from the state. That's right. Everything. What's See, going on in the state as a what whole. What they're going on in the state as a whole, because that's, what, that's exactly right. See, those are the things that are out of your control, but you're obviously affected by it. Correct. That's exactly right. And, and we have we have managed, and I don't see Rich yeah. letting that management slip any. I'm, I, right. I, th I think we manage very well, and we'll continue that. Right. So, th so that's the issue that we wanted to speak to: is that we have a statement that <coughs> says that you know right. they understand where we're at, but they want you to be aware of of what decisions you make, what 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 effect those decisions could have on your rating. And if there is a change in rating, what happens is that the interest rate you have tonight on your financing does not change, or any of your outstanding debt does not change, okay? What will happen is that those bondholders all bought your bonds, assuming you have a AA credit quality, and that they're, they can sell them to someone else for a AA quality. If they drop to a single A, now they have lost some value, so you have some unhappy investors out there. What happens going forward with every financing is every financing you do going forward has a higher interest rate cost to it, every one. And the investors that may have been traditional buyers of your, your, your bonds in the past will do one of two things. They will either be very unhappy that their bonds now have a lower rating and will not participate, so you have shrunk the market, or they will say, fine, we'll participate, but there will be a price for our participation. So again, it comes back to costing the city. And to get back to those municipalities who might have lost a credit rating and want to set a goal to come back and, and uh, recover their rating um, takes a long time because even if you get to that goal, rating agencies don't reward you with an upgrade. They want to see trend, and trend is three years minimum to a rating agency. So once you get to that level, again, of comfort, you have to get, wait to at least demonstrate to them that it stays there for three years. Obviously, our state's in that yeah. case right now. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, you can see their credit reports have negative outlooks on them. Right. And that's one of the reasons they have negative outlooks. Now, we don't have a negative outlook. Correct. Okay? So I don't want you to think that that's happened here. I just want you to know, which, you know, in some ways, it's nice for the, for the rating agencies to tell us that they're thinking about this rather than all of a sudden tell us they did this. So, so okay, so I just want you to know that. We definitely will do our homework and make sure we don't get there. Okay. All right. Thank you. All of them off? Your Honor, as you said, I'm, uh, Rich will be watching that fund balance very carefully. Cool. And I, as chairman, and as long as I am chairman of finance, will also be doing um, whatever needs to uh, to make sure that we, we control that. And I'm, I know the rest of the finance committee will be doing the same because uh, we do not want to go below the AA credit rating. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions before we pass this? Any questions? Okay, Pat, would you call the roll, please? Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Brinfleisch? Aye. Pardon me? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. 14 eyes. Motion carried. Oh, okay, you have one, another one? Because I was going to call Alderman Montemayor. I have to make the motion oh, from the right. consent agenda first. Please. <laughs> Under the consent agenda, Your Honor, which is 15.1 through 15.21, I would move that we, that all RCs be accepted and adopted, that all ROs be accepted and filed, and that we pass all resolutions. Accept. Okay. Accept. We have a motion before us that all our ROs be accepted and filed, resolutions be put upon as passage, and RCs be accepted and adopted. Except he wanted number nine referred yeah. back to okay. finance. Yeah, Alderman Montemayor wanted to refer that. Is that what you yeah. were going to speak on, Alderman Montemayor? We okay. don't need a motion. Oh, we can we, just, okay. We can just we'll accept a 15 9, 59, which I'd like referred back to finance. Correct. Right. That's Henry's document. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 1519. 
1519 also, yes, that will be referred back to uh, redevelopment. redevelopment Authority. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Forgot about that one. Alderman Warner, you had a. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Honor. I'd like to speak on, on uh, document number 1518. Okay. And also, Your Honor, after the consent agenda, I would like to pull forward 14.1 and 14.30 so these people uh, regarding the uh, vacation of the street don't have to sit here for a whole meeting. Okay. So, on document 1518, uh, at our last committee of the whole meeting, we heard from Leah Merriman, Kathy Schultz, and Gerald Miller regarding SAM or Save American Manufacturing. And that's what document 1518 is. It is uh, the Save American Manufacturing Resolution that came to the Committee of the Whole and was forwarded to the Common Council for consideration. This resolution is important, and it's important in many ways. Just last week, our city was saddened to hear the reduction in the workforce at Plast Plastics Engineering Company which is a direct result of unfair and unequal trade practices. I can understand that some might think we have no business being involved in such issues at the local level of government, but I disagree with their position. Where else and how else can we make a statement expressing our sentiments on issues that have a direct impact on us, on you, on me, on our neighbors, on our friends, our local businesses, and our employers? I submit that we have an obligation to express our concerns to our state and federal leaders regarding such issues that negatively impact our people. Personally, I do not agree with this resolution word for word, but I do agree with its intent and with its message, and I will support it. I think that free trade is a good idea, and that concept is well-intentioned. Yet I think that any free trade agreement must provide protections that ensure the playing field is level. Americans, our companies, and our people can and do compete successfully with anyone when the playing field is level. When the rules are fairly laid out, Americans also compete and succeed many times when the scales are tipped against us. But lately it seems things have moved beyond what could be considered an imbalance to an outright threat to our own security and future. It is at times like this when one must speak out, especially to those in a position to have an impact on our future as a city, a state, and a nation. Economic warfare is not as apparent as typical military warfare. It doesn't have the flash and bang, of course, and the results do not come apparent uh, quite as quickly. But economic warfare is no less a battle, and in this case, a battle to maintain our economic future and our country's ability to produce manufactured goods is no less important than a military war. Should we ever lose our manufacturing ability, we would lo also lose our military ability, and our entire nation would be in jeopardy. I believe it is not only proper, but our obligation to send a message to our state and federal leadership that they need to consider the impact their decisions on trade agreements have upon us. From our national security to our pocketbooks and our future as Americans, it is important that any existing and future trade agreements include the proper protections for U.S. companies and workers. I am not against our nation's corporations and multinational companies owning and operating overseas or across continents. I think the world has changed dramatically in the past 30 years. I think our companies must compete and operate all over the world, all over the world, to stay profitable and maintain their leadership role in industry. I do, however, believe that free trade agreements come with responsibility. Responsibility to make sure that Americans and American companies are not put at a disadvantage because of unfair trade practices. This is critical to our country's future. I think this resolution sends a clear message, and I think we should all support it. Thank you. Did you want a separate vote on that? Yes, please. Voice vote? Mm hmm Okay. 15-18, we need a voice vote on it? Yes. Um, under discussion four. Under discussion. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Alderman Warner for his comments regarding uh, this. I, too, voted for it as a statement, and I will do so again today. But I do care about saving Amer American manufacturing. Uh, there's one thing that's more important to me, though, than saving American manufacturing, and that's saving Sheboygan manufacturing. Uh, this is a statement, but we have to keep in mind that a lot of what we do does impact the ability for Sheboygan manufacturers to be here. Um, we are not only in competition with overseas markets, we're in competition with other states, and we're in competition with other cities within Wisconsin. If a plant relocates here to Wausau, those are Sheboygan jobs lost. 
Um, so I'd just like to point out that everything that we do uh, that makes businesses not be able to compete locally uh, is just as important to me as the statement about fair trade as well. Alderman Moody, do you want to speak on this issue? Okay. Alderman Montemayor, did you want to speak on this issue? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Alderman Warner, I, I agree with your statements. I still sort of feel that the city shouldn't get involved. We're setting a precedent of maybe things that we don't want to get involved with. However, talking to numerous staffers in Washington, the most effective communication they get is an actual letter from an actual person with an actual signature, more than big lists of names or emails or group sending. The most effective is your letter with your name and your envelope. Thank you. If there's no other discussion on this issue, we'll vote on this one first, this document, and then I'll get you Alderman Woody. Please. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. Okay, Alderman Moody. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. On 1516, uh, RC by the Special Committee on Risk Management recommending denying claim from Richard Poole for alleged damages to his tires when he ran over a sandwich detour sign and serving notice of disallowance. Mr. Poole called me about this. He said that a sign was laying in the road, evidently maybe some kids had thrown it in the road or something, but the construction, the actual construction had been finished for a week already. That sign should have been removed. Could I just ask what the discussion was in committee about that? Mike, you want to answer that? Uh, Betty, that was, uh, uh, we investigated that matter. The sign, uh, we did not, city did not have any signs located in that area. What we found it to be was a sign placed there, we thought, by a contractor working for the water utility. Okay. So the uh, claim was referred to the water utility, and I believe Mr. Poole got a denial from the water utility also. Okay. It was unknown how the, how the sign uh, Found so its way the into sign the had nothing to do with the city? No, it was definitely not ours. Okay, thank you. Okay. With that taken care of, everything else from 15-1 through 15-21 will be put upon its passage. Pat, would you call the roll? Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Ben Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Wongelman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. 14 eyes. Motion carried. 1520. No. Nope. Warner. Ah, uh, excuse me. Alderman Warner. Back up a minute. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to pull forward document 14.1 and 14.30. Okay, that's under other matters. Alderman Warner? Document 14.1 is a communication from Mark Dingle of 1601 Illinois Avenue, requesting the council approve the vacation of South 16th Street from Illinois Avenue to 150 feet south, and I would move to accept and file. You can do them together. Do them together. Okay. And on the RO, which is document 1430, RO number 344-0304, be placed on file and the attached substitute ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Okay, moved and second to communication 14-1 be accepted in the file, the RO be accepted in the file, and the substitute general ordinance be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, this will vacate the property as requested by Mark Dingle in the previous communication. This property has been sitting unused forever, except by the people using it as a cut-through point illegally, public and public works and public protection and safety have dealt with many problems in this area. Uh, this action will not only put the property on the tax rolls, but also allow the residents to keep the property up. And we've, we've been working on this one for a long time, and the commission recommends approval. Okay. <clears throat> Did anyone want to speak on that? I just wanted to make sure that the council was going to vote for it. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have a motion before us. Pat, would you call the roll, please? Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Acton? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Longerman? Aye. 
Warner. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried 1522 through 1524 to be referred. 1525 will go to Plan Commission. 1526, Public Protection and Safety. Don't read them all. <laughs> no, I don't have to read them all. You're right. 1525 through through 1535 to be referred. Fifteen thirty-seven by Alderman Groff, transferring funds to provide monies for the Crisis Command and Mobile Command software installation. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> that resolution, along with Resolution fifteen thirty-eight, which is ratifying entering into the Autodesk Government Pilot Program Software License Agreement, agreement, excuse me, and task order, I would ask for a suspension on those two documents. Been moved a second for suspension. Is there any objections of the suspension? Any objections? Proceed. I would ask that the two resolutions be put upon their passage. Moved a second to resolutions be put upon their passage. Under discussion. Alderman Orner. Discussion, Your Honor. I would just like an explanation of what what this is. So Alderman, public knows what we're voting on. If we can, who would like to explain that? Margie. Margie. <coughs> This is a project to enhance our graphical information system, our GIS system. It's tying our maps with information. Um, this particular project is to tie our information from our fire department to the mapping that the engineering department is doing right now. And it's like a pilot project to get us going so we can tie additional information that we have to the maps so that it can be used in all the departments. Okay. Thank you, Margie. If there's another discussion, would you call a roll, please? Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1539 by Alderman Graf, Weininger, Stefan, Doyle, and Bonnet. Transferring, authorizing transferring funds to establish estimated revenue and appropriation for professional services in the building inspection department. Alderman Grau. Your Honor, I ask for a suspension on this resolution. It's moved and seconded for suspension. Is there any objections? Any objections? Hearing none, proceed. I would ask that this resolution be put upon its passage. Moved and seconded a resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. By Alderman Van Akron, Wangaman, Winninger, Manny, and Perez authorizing the Chief of Police to hire two new police officers immediately. Alderman Van Akron. Your Honor, I move the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Moved and second, a resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, I'd like to amend the, the resolution where it says hire two. I'd like to change that to three. The reason for that is that since we talked about hiring two, one other one person went back to teaching school. So we have three openings and they are all paid, budgeted for this year and next year. Second. It's been moved and seconded, first of all, for the amendment of not, rather than hiring two to add three new police officers. Under discussion. Hearing none, do you need a roll on that? All in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried, okay. Now I move that uh, resolution as amended be put upon its passage. Moved and second the resolution be put upon its passage as amended under discussion. Alderman Ryan Flesh. Uh, just a quick question. I uh, know working with Public Works, we came through uh, to find a 5% decrease in, this, in the budget and, uh, for Public Works. I guess I'd just like to ask how um, 
you know, certainly hope we can do so. Uh, I know there's a need to, to fill these positions, but how does this impact the budgeting process and savings Chief. for next year as well? We have been dealing with the, uh, the mayor and different uh, committees um, for many months now on how to, to reach those, uh, those numbers. Uh, these three positions are funded positions that we have in the 2003 budget. Uh, we do have an agreement that uh, we're four vacancies or we're four short next year. Uh, two of those are unfunded, two are funded. So we are, uh, these are our dollars that are there. These are positions that were there until the uh, three probationary officers uh, resigned for a number of different reasons. Uh, so this is a separate distinct issue than what the 5% is. Uh, we, were, we were planning these, uh, these were there, they were filled before we were dealing with the 5%. Thank you. Chief. Yeah, Alderman Stefan. Can't believe you asked him to stay. You must have read my mind. Um, I certainly think we need these, and I'm in support, but as we move forward into the budget period of time, I just have a, some questions, I, and I'm going to say some, some things, and I'm glad the chief is here, because if I misspeak from what we talked about at finance the other night, feel free to cor correct me. My first concern, and I'm just bringing these up because I'd like to see either the, the mayor, public protection and safety, your salaries agreements, you know, we've got to resolve these issues, I think, at budget time, which is on, upon us. First issue is overtime. You know, I always was under the impression, and maybe I want to be clear because maybe I was wrong, when the chief said we're five officers short, we're six officers short, whatever it was, and we've been short all the time lately. I always thought that meant, you know, okay, if he's four officers short, that's one less cop walking the street pretty much all the time maybe. You know, there's four shifts, different shifts. It's really not the case. What we've been doing is we've been using our overtime and taking the money that was budgeted for patrols and putting it into overtime. And He's really short now, I think it's eight people, so you know, now they're probably, okay. There is an effect, you know, maybe, but in the past, even when they were four, five, six short, they've been able to pretty much use overtime, use supervisors in vehicles to minimize the impact upon the service to the community. And I just feel that's wrong. I think, you know, we should say, hey, let's put the money into patrol salaries. Overtime is, you know, we're losing. We're, we think in other areas it works, in other areas, a person retires and we say, well, you know what, we won't fill that job for six months. And there's a savings there. In the police department, there's not a savings because instead of filling that patrol officer, we're just spending the money on overtime. Or we're paying supervisors to do overtime. So I don't see that we're benefiting by not filling patrol spots. I think it's, you know, it's upon us to say this is what, how many patrol officers we want. I believe this year with the last uh, change, we had like 300, $250,000 or $300,000 worth of overtime. Again, because he was so far behind, it was just switched over. It didn't increase the budget at all because it went from patrol salaries into the various overtime budgets. But I just said, we should make the commitment that we're going to fund the patrol at whatever it is, and that's what it is. You know what I mean? And, and the, the overtime should be kept for emergencies, for officers in court, and those types of things, because it's also putting a tremendous pressure on his police officers. You know, they can't get the time off when they work the overtime anyway, so they, you know, they're just working and working and working. So that's one issue I think we have to make a commitment to say we're funding patrol salaries and we're not going to play games with moving the money into overtime. Because it doesn't work if we say, oh, we'll fill that in six months. We're, we're not saving any money by doing that. In other areas, of the, we are saving money, but I don't believe so in this area that it, we are saving money much, if ever. Um, the other thing we talked about in June or July of last year was what about the liaison officers? Currently, as we approach this budget, the liaison officers are in the budget, budgeted as they have been in the past. When we got to last June and July, we said, well, we can't really tell the school district we're not funding them in August because they were under that impression. But I think this is the time to say, yeah, it's definitely going to be in the budget till June or July. Do we want to move forward with it? And there again, that, you know, that's got to be done with the chief and public protection and safety. What's the best use of his manpower? You know, patrolling people on the street, liaison, can we afford both as we have? What is the school board? What are they going to do? Are they going to take them out? Are they going to fund them fully? Those are all things that we should be looking at that impact this, but I think in the near future is the time to take care of that. Um, we also have a retirement coming up sometime in January and February of a supervisor. You know, if, if when we use this overtime, part of our solution is to put the, some, some of the supervisors on the streets patrolling, maybe we can do as the other departments have and reorganize and use that money to put more officers on the streets and patrol if that's where we need them. And I think that needs to be looked at to see that we're using the best use of our manpower. And lastly, 
documents came to us tonight. We haven't voted on them. We're going to vote on them next time. All the, police, or all the other unions have made some type of sacrifice, okay, to, in an act of solidarity, I guess. As of now, I'm not aware that the police group, I know they're still talking, but I don't think they've come up with anything yet. And I know the chief had mentioned one time, he talked to somebody and they said, well, part of the problem is they think they're sacrificing because they're working all this overtime. You know, and I guess my concern is I think if they don't come forward with some type of concession, I can only draw two questions. One is it's benefiting them if we keep paying the overtime. Why would the officer sacrifice? Because he's benefiting because he'll get the overtime if we don't fill the positions. And on the other hand, if, if I don't find that true, the other one is maybe they just don't think they need to patrol people on the streets. So I you know, certainly encourage the officers to look at that because I think you know, it wouldn't be right if all the other employees are coming forward with some type of, you know, to keep their fellow brother working and the police officers don't do that. But you know, I think all of those are kind of different, but you know, those are things that we need to kind of settle beforehand, you know, because I just don't think, I, I think we're kidding ourselves if we say let's hire two cops and let the other four sit and we're going to spend the money on overtime, let's hire them, let's put them on the street and you're not saving any money by using the overtime. I, I just feel that's an inefficient way we should be funding the officers. And I will support this. Thank you. Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And I agree with, all, with Alderman Stepan on that. We would love not to have to have officers working overtime and believe me, after, after working a full shift and then staying longer every day, they don't want to work overtime either because they're getting burned out. We really would rather have more officers on the street that works the same way in the fire department. People don't want to work overtime anymore. They like their time off uh, in the fire department. The younger guys usually would get it. I, I believe in the police department they try the same thing, but some of these people don't want to work overtime anymore. They're burning themselves out, and uh, the only way you can reduce that is to uh, hire live bodies that can be there. And, then we can reduce the overtime budgets, and that's a good idea. Alderman Van Acker. Your Honor, uh, he also will be getting two more officers in January, which was approved by this committee, which was held off in January. So he'll be actually getting five men by the end of January. Correct. So Chief, Chief's agreement with me is these D3 positions are unforeseen. Yeah. No knowledge that this was going to happen. They're funded. Correct. We agreed upon filling them, and the other two in January. So you will be down to which is an agreement, which was in the concessions for your five percent for next year. Correct? We'll actually be down uh, three. Well, positions. with the retirement, Correct. right? If we don't, if we don't fill that retirement, you'd be down three. Absolutely. We've been uh, speaking, and we did come to an agreement uh, back last summer that we would leave two vacant. Correct. Police officer positions, unfunded positions. Right. Correct. So he is meeting his 5% that way. Thank you, Chief. Okay, if there's another discussion, would you call the roll, please? Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Ankren? Aye. Vanderweel? Wangaman? Wangaman? <laughs> of all people. <laughs> Warner, Winninger, Bauman, Berg, Bonet, Doyle, Graf, Montemayor. 14 eyes. Motion carried. 1541, uh, we'll go back to Special Marina Committee. 1542 will lie over. Also 1543, unless you want something else with that, Alderman Graf. Your Honor, um, 1543 is the um, the um, resolution that uh, is being uh, looked at to revise the, uh, the agreement with the, the firefighters and the um, and the city regarding concessions for um, for 2004. And um, according to our last strategic fiscal planning meeting, and according to uh, the um, budget formation policy that we um, we passed on, on this council. Uh, some type of recommendation is supposed to come from strategic fiscal planning on, on these documents, and um, at this time I would move that we refer this to strategic fiscal planning. Second. Moved and seconded that this be referred to strategic fiscal plan. Under discussion, Alderman Warner. Uh, Your Honor, I guess I would ask that uh, we can leave the document lie over in council and refer it to strategic fiscal plan at the same can't, time. Can't, can't do both. Okay. That's the problem, you can't do Well, then I, I just think that uh, I don't know what we're going to achieve by sending it back to strategic fiscal planning, and I guess I would like a better explanation of why 
other than just that we can change our mind. We have all the other documents here from the other agreements, and I think we should consider this one in the same light. Alderman Burke. Yes, if uh, Rich Gephardt could uh, step up to the podium and uh, explain if this is uh, an actual savings or if it's a wash or who is gaining anything on, on this deal with the firemen. I guess the uh, one difference that uh, this proposal has from the other is that uh, the concessions here from the uh, fire union would reinstate uh, one firefighter, but in order for them to provide the additional or maintain the, the one truck, uh, they have to have teams of three. And they're planning on, in their original plan here, to lay off three firefighters. As I said, their concessions were in state one. Um, under this agreement, the, we would have to have a funding plan for the other two firefighters, which we have under discussion with the chief. Um, but we would have to bring that to the committee to put that in place. Uh, as we all know, this year is uh, scarce resources. We would, we'd have to find uh, a source for that difference. And uh, that's why we need uh, some discussion in the committee to come back with a plan to council on that, at least through the budget process, we would come back with that plan. Um, so the, that's the variance from the other uh, proposals from the unions. Ed or Chief, do either one of you want to speak on this? If you, you know, if you wish to send it to finance committee or wherever, but I, somehow we have to confirm that we have an agreement on a plan. I think some of the discussions right now that are scheduled and strategic, such as uh, the capital outlay in the general fund and the um, you know the cable transfer, some of those could be part of this discussion as we try to formulate this plan. So that's why we thought strategic might be the place. Chief Ed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Common Council. Um, basically, it's a difference of numbers. Uh, working with the mayor, I appreciate uh, getting a chance to work with the mayor and saving the first three firefighters. Uh, with that savings of the first three firefighters, which we gave up overtime money and some other money through the budget, that actually created three people that wouldn't be laid off, unemployment costs and severance payout, which is about thirty-some thousand dollars. Uh, that was in the, basically dollar for dollar being saved to the proposal of the firefighters, which brings in about $62,000. The proposal with, that I made with the mayor, along with the proposal with, that the firefighters, saves another three firefighters, which is another thirty-some thousand dollars in unemployment costs. Basically, it's about $125,000 worth of savings of the $159,000 that's needed to save the three positions, leaving about $30,000 that the Common Council would have to come up with to maintain the status of the safety of the citizens that I believe that the level of services is needed. If you do nothing and say, lay off three firefighters, you have a $33,000 a severance package, unemployment that you're self-insured costs. So basically, in my figures, in my numbers, when we put this together, it's a wash. But the first $31,000, everything was taken out of the unemployment prior to this agreement with the firefighters. So from the 30000 it's now about 60000 So yes, Rich Keppert's numbers basically are right. I still believe that my numbers are what was on my budget, which creates it basically being a wash. But I guess that, that's why it's being referred to uh, strategic fiscal planning. But it has been a, you know, basically passed unanimously by the Public Protection and Safety Committee, passed the Salary Grievance Committee, and thank you, Donnie Von Ackman, for hearing our, the firefighters and, and the fire union come in in good faith effort to try and maintain the staffing at the backs of the, themselves, the employees themselves coming forth, knowing that it's the best for the citizens of Sheboygan's protection to keep that truck in service and for their safety when they respond. And uh, so I guess that's where it is. And I guess where the money is going to have to come from, the 30000 or 60000 that's going to be debated. But it's an option that I haven't heard of any other city employees coming forth, and that's basically where, the, where it's I believe it's catching on around the state, though. When we started asking yes. our employees to come forward, other cities are doing that now. And I you know, have to commend the mayor. Uh, when, we, when this started, this process back started back a few months ago, and our 
and Ed Sirk in our staff meetings. Um, the mayor said, you know, let's go to our employees. They're part, they're part of, let them be part of the resolution. Uh, not knowing what would happen, they came forth, all the unions came forth with different programs, different projects, because they had, some had contracts and some didn't have contracts. Some had different work schedules and others, they could work it out. But everyone's an individual type agreement, and I think one thing that you have to remember, you have city employees willing to give back something that they already negotiated what they had to try and keep the city going at least for another year. Who knows what's going to happen in 2005? We might be right back here laying people off in 2005. I hope not. Hope something changes. Hope things get better. But at least for the year 2004, as far as the fire department is, re is reflected, we can keep all of our trucks operating the way it is, thanks to the membership giving back almost $65,000 of their money. That's about $1,000 per firefighter that they've been giving back. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Alderman Warner. I thank you, Your Honor. I guess I've had nothing but positive feedback regarding the firefighters stepping up to the plate, not only on the job, providing emergency medical services and fire protection, but also for lending a hand to help solve our budget problems in 2004 by returning one half of their raise to the city taxpayers. It may be not directly, but it is still there and it is still money that the city is saving. When our unions in this city came forward and said, we're gonna work with you instead of against you on this, every single one of them that came forward is offering something. We have seven different unions. There's some that still have, have some work to do, but out of seven different unions, we never have seven contracts that are the same. There's a different way of applying every single one of them. And they all have their things that are important to them. And I think that when our employees come forward and they offer something to us to help the city move forward, that, that we should do all we can to accept it. If we have to find some, make some changes in this, we can do that without this document. I, I just don't understand why we have to keep, why we have to send this to, to strategic when it's right here in front of us today, and I think we should take action on it along with the rest of them. All the Yeah, <clears throat> we can't take action on this because it's here to lie over or to be referred to strategic. At our last strategic meeting, the the five or the four committee chairmen and um, um, Alderman Winninger had voted to review all these at strategic, and that's why I'm referring this to to strategic to review these. So um, that was my motion and. That's it. <clears throat> just before I, I know I've spoken twice already, Your Honor. Ed, all of them, or just We're this just one? We're just on this one right now. That's We're just point. on this one right now. That's where you feel the fire cars reach you. Ask the city hall uh, labor contract, which came in the same way as the fire cars didn't get referred to strategic fiscal planning. This is before you just pass it tonight. It kind of separates the two. Alderman Wangaman. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a comment or two on this. Uh, the Chief has made a uh, point in the past that how imperative it is that we retain the present staffing on the fire department. A, Chief, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you had said it takes approximately 16 men to respond to a general alarm. Their normal shift is 19, so it doesn't take much in the way of mathematics to see if we, get, if we lay off three people. When they respond to a general alarm, they have no one in reserve, uh, which could be extremely urgent. Usually what happens is that reserve vehicle gets pulled downtown, so it's central. Now, any time that you receive a uh, fire call from a school or a hospital or whatever, a uh, general alarm is declared and all units respond except one, which is held in reserve. Now, we don't go along with this system, we're going to end up where we have no one in reserve. Now, on an ambulance call, when the fire department is our first responders and there's no one there to respond, it, it could mean life and property. So it's a real uh, life issue. So it's, it's very important that the fire department uh, maintain its present uh, level of staffing. And we sat through some of these meetings with the fire the fires union, and I have to uh, commend them for, you know, as uh, Alderman Warner said, stepping up to the plate and and uh, really finding a solution for a very vexing problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question for Rich. You guys have to make a decision on this one or the other. Normally these lay over, these contracts lay over for two weeks. Rich, we spoke about this in staff this morning. The final decision on how the money is allocated from these concessions would be at strategic. To get a strateg strategic, though, you said, or I shouldn't say you said, it was discussed this morning that if it goes today or if it, if it would lie over, we could implement that money after the budget's passed 
It didn't have to be immediately, correct? I mean, the decisions have to be made there somewhere along the line is strategic, but you still have contracts coming in. Which we're, we're, I think we're talking about a different uh, uh, proposal, not the correct. fire proposal, right. first of all. It's a different one. Yes. So it's, it's on another item on, on the, that's on the agenda. But right. yes, on some of the other ones, uh, because you're just doing an exchange of appropriations in some cases, uh, that decision could be made after the uh, budget and tax levy are set as we make other budget changes in the course of the year. That was my only point, but it was not on this proposal that I was saying that. The, the concern on this one is having sufficient appropriations to maintain right. the three firefighter level. Correct. Okay, thank you. Alderman Groff, do you have something you want to? Okay. All right, we have a motion before us. Pat? You want a roll call? Sure. This is to refer the uh, 1543 to strategic fiscal Rather than letting lie over. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stefan? No. Van Ankeren? No. Vanderweel? No. Wangeman? No. Warner? No. Weininger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonnet? No. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Montemayor? Aye. Moody? No. Seven eyes, seven no's. We will let it lie over for two weeks and then we'll take, the, take that route and we will work on it in strategic as we get it. Okay. 1546 to be referred. Oh, excuse me, 1544 and 45 will lie over. 1546 to be referred. 1547 will lie over. 1548 and 49 to lie over. 1550 and 51 to be referred. 1334, RO by City Plan Commission, recommending amending the zoning ordinance to permit exceptions to maximize height regulations by conditional use or variance procedures. Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I'd move to accept and file the report of officer. And if I could take 1364 with it, that that general ordinance be put upon its passage. Moved and second that the RO be accepted and filed and the ordinance be put upon its passage under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, this is an ordinance amending the text of the City of Sheboygan official zoning ordinance in section 15.406 so as to permit exceptions to the maximum height regulations by condition, conditional use or variance procedure. Right now it is only by conditional use and this will allow a variance procedure also. This was discussed in the plan commission and the plan commission recommends passage. We need further explanation. Steve is here, and I'm sure he could do that. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Stefan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? 14 eyes. Motion carried. 1429 RO by City Plan Commission recommending vacating the unpaved alley between South 17th Street and South 18th Street and between Alabama <laughs> Avenue and Georgia Avenue. Alderman Warner. Warner. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I move to accept and file the report of officer and that the general ordinance be put upon its passage. You want to take the next one, too? Sure. On 1431, I make a motion to accept and file that report of officer and that that general ordinance be put upon its passage also. It's moved and second. Our rules be accepted and filed and both generals. One substitute general ordinance and one ordinance be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor. Uh, this is relative to vacating the unpaved alley between South 17th Street and South 18th Street and between Alabama Avenue and George Avenue. The abutting property owners have requested the city vacate this unimproved east-west alley. The plan commission recommends approval and the property will be added back to the tax rolls. And on 1431, uh, that is uh, relative to rezoning the property located at 1320 Niagara Avenue from class 
urban industrial to class urban commercial classification. This is the former city tool shed, I believe, and uh, it's going to be used for boat storage and is, in fact, being used for boat storage and, and a repair facility. And it fits very well with the present and future development along our riverfront and our lakefront. The Planning Commission recommends passage of both. Okay, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, call roll. Van Ankeren? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wongerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1432 RO by the purchasing agent submitting a summary of proposals for obtaining prescription benefit management services. Alderman McGraw. Your Honor, I would move that the RO 1432 be accepted and filed and that we pass a resolution um, which is um, authorizing the City of Sheboygan to enter into a contract for obtaining prescription benefit management services from um, Restep. Moved and second, I will be accepted and filed in resolution 1444 be put upon its passage under discussion. Alderman Warner. Under discussion, Your Honor, I just want to commend Alderman Groff. This could potentially save the city over $121,000, and I think this is a good example of how active city officials are looking at ways to save money from every angle and every aspect, and Alderman Groff did a good job on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James. <coughs> is there any other discussion? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Vanderweel? Aye. Wongaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Rinfleisch? Stephan? Van Akron? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1445, resolution by Alderman Graf, Winninger, Doyle, and Bonet, transferring appropriations in the 2003 budget. Alderman Graf. Yeah, and I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Moved and second a resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Wongerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. The next three, 1442, 1428, and 1443 are resolutions and ROs uh, on contracts also. Ed, you want to speak on that? Before, first of all, let's get a motion on the floor. Alderman Ben Akron. I move that uh, 42 be accepted and adopted and the RO be filed and uh, 1443 be accepted and adopted. It's been moved that RO 1428 be accepted and filed in resolutions 1442 and 43 be put upon their passage. Under discussion, Ed. Yeah, the first contract is a local 1564 ASME, which is, <clears throat> which represents uh, basically our city hall employees uh, and engineering employees and in some, uh, some other groups throughout the city. But uh, basically, uh, it is a reopener of a two-year contract. Uh, the contract is for um, 03 and 04. And what the union came up with was uh, the raise that was anticipated to be taken on January 1st of 1904, or 2004, I'm sorry, would be frozen until December 31st of 04. Um, the second agreement is with uh, Local 2039, ASME, which represents our public works employees, and basically uh, it's a two-year contract. Um, they have also agreed, uh, I won't go into particular details, I think each of the older persons has one, but basically they have also agreed uh, to um, uh, the, the raise effective uh, January of 2004 again, and January would be frozen until uh, December 31st of 04. And uh, uh, I, I commend both unions. I think it was a, a very substantial concessions on, on, on both parts. All the way around. Okay, yeah. Hang on, Ed. Hang on, Ed. You might have a question here. Or you had a question over them, I would assume. Well, <clears throat> just again, these, these two agreements, um, <clears throat> I believe one of them is connected to the, the contract, which we're, we're, should approve tonight. Uh, 
but there's no way that these two agreements for these concessions that they're making can be referred to um, to uh, strategic fiscal planning unless all three documents are, correct? I believe so. Well, because that's what our policy calls for, I will move that um, the three documents be referred to strategic fiscal planning. No second. <clears throat> Do I have to lock a second? Yep. Okay. Okay. Ed? Um, maybe Don might want to address this too. Typically, we, when we resolve a contract, it goes through salary and grievance, which both the, the reopener on the contract and the extra contract itself. And then we'll comes to common council, is laid over, and, and then uh, is accepted. Uh, I don't know, Steve. <clears throat> Uh, that's standard on the, on when uh, contracts are acted on by the council, but it's really up to the council as to, you know, uh, council is the governing body of the city. If, if they want to send something to a particular committee, they've got every right to do that, but that requires a majority of the council to want to send it somewhere else. Okay. Any other questions? Alderman Yes, Yes. Um, I commend all the, the two unions that, that brought back these concessions and so forth, but I cannot support either one of them. Okay. Um, and I'd like to, to vote for the contract itself but and vote no against the, um, the concessions. And that's only because we're just delaying a problem that we're going to face come the end of 2004. The, both concessions are delaying 1.75%, I believe, is correct, of their 2004 salary until the end of, of 2004. So we have basically a year to play with as to um, what needs to be done, what changes can be made, and um, if, if we don't stand firm and make some suggestions, like even combining departments, uh, uh, cutting staff, uh, whatever we have to do, we're just duplicating and doubling up on a problem that we're going to face for 2005 and 2006. So um, I'm not going to steal from Peter to pay Paul, and I'm, I won't vote for any of these contracts. Okay. Any other discussion? Thank you, Ed. No, no other. Would you call the roll, please? Warner. Oh, there was no second to his referral. referral. There was a second there to accepting second to the contracts. Passing 1442 and 1443 and accepting and filing 1428, the R.O. It's not to refer. It's not to refer. It's for passage. Mm -hmm. Warner? Aye. Weniger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? No. Groff? No. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Twelve ayes, two noes. Motion carried. We will still have to revisit some of this in uh, strategic alderman drop later on. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. <clears throat> okay. As we move forward, 1450. RC by Public Protection and Safety recommending, recommending filing communication from John Damerel and Charles Borth requesting no parking signs from the southeast corner of Wildwood Avenue and Evans Avenue south 200 feet and passing the attached ordinance. Alderman Warner. Well, thank you, Your Honor. I would make a motion to accept and file the report of committee and pass the attached ordinance. Moved and seconded that we accept and adopt the report of committee and the past ordinance under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, um, I thank you. This is in response to a communication from John Damro and Charles Borth requesting no parking signs from the southeast corner of Wildwood Avenue and Evans Avenue, south approximately 200 feet. Now, this was discussed at Public Protection Safety Committee's meeting, and the city's traffic sergeant, Sergeant Tarkowski, recommended the changes. Over the years, there have been many complaints by the residents of people parking in the way of their driveways and even driving over their lawns. Well, this is a unique area, and we expect this change to alleviate the problems for now, for once and for all, and into the future with the changes in that area. Recommend passage. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Winninger? 
Bowman, Bird, Boney, Doyle, Grass, Montemayor, Moody, Rinfleisch, Stephan, Van Ankren, Vanderweel, Wongman, Warner. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1461 RC by Special Committee on Risk Management recommending that the library be allowed to participate in the city's medical prescription drug and dental benefit programs effective in 2004. Alderman Groff. Yeah, and I'll move that the RC be accepted and adopted. <coughs> Moved and second, RC be accepted and adopted. Under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Oh, you don't need one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 1410 will go to a special committee on risk management. 1411 will go to Special Committee on Risk Management, and 1414 will go to the Special Committee on Risk Management. Other matters, 1552 will go to Public Works, 1553 to Public Works. Steve? 1554 is a communication received by the Mayor from Burdett Schultz of Sheboygan Memorial Post 9156 requesting extension of time to vacate the property at 911 North 11th Street. That will go to Planning Commission. 1555 is a resolution authorizing a 100 watt high pressure sodium street light for the intersection of North 15th Street and Grand Avenue at the northeast corner. That will go to Public Works. 1556 is a resolution approving City of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Police Department accepting the local law enforcement block grant fund and expending them for the intended purpose. And that will go to Public Protection and Safety. Oh, hang on, Alderman McGraw. Your Honor, uh, just to, to let uh, everyone know, there is a risk management meeting called for um, September or, or November 6th <laughs> at, I believe, 6 o'clock. And uh, three items on the agenda is discussion of those, um, of those uh, agreements and concessions, and we will still discuss those. Thank you. Good. Who made the second? Uh, the other? Oh, it's strategic, yeah. The other thing is uh, the 20th, November 20th, I, I believe, correct, Rich? We talked special meeting. There will be a special, go ahead, Rich, there will be a special hearing on the budget. Yes, the mayor has uh, scheduled the hearing on the budget to be Thursday, the 20th, at 7 o'clock, and then we'll have the regular meeting on the 24th for passage. passage of the budget in the tax levy. Okay. And the only items we'll be discussed that night is the budget. Everything on the budget. Pardon? It's, it'll just That'll be, be public input to come up. It'll just be the hearing, no documents. No documents, just a hearing. And uh, we'll give each one time to speak at the mic. So. Move to second for adjournment. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 